Hello Interwebs, welcome to Let's Fix Computers. Uh, my friend messaged me yesterday and said uh, my computer turned itself off and now it won't turn back on again. Uh, and I said, <clears throat> okay, that sounds an awful lot like a bad power supply to me. Uh, get your computer over to my shop and I'll take a look at it for you. So here it is, let's take a look. So, um, computers that won't turn on and no posts, I do see them every now and then, but they don't often make it into videos because I spend 10 minutes waffling about what it could be and how to approach this problem, only to find that just popping out the BIOS battery was all it needed, and I'm like, hmm, okay. Uh, so, I'm going to spare most of the guff for now, we're going to dive straight into this, and as we go into it, we'll go, you know, the more detail we need to go into, the more detail I shall reveal. Um, so, first of all, computer that doesn't switch on, it's apparently stone dead, let's find out. I've not tested it. Power on at the back, and power button at the front. Nope, nothing. I see a light down on the PCI Express slots there, so there is standby power. But, yeah, power button doing absolutely nothing. It is indeed mega dead. So... Um, as soon as you see any kind of lights on the motherboard and stuff like that, a lot of people instantly assume that that must mean the power supply is okay. That's not the case. Even a no post where it turns on and the fan starts spinning, but there's no output, that can still be a bad power supply. This is one of the reasons why the little handheld power supply testers are worthless. Um, they might be good just to check if the, if the power supply is turbo dead, like stone dead, However, they're not reliable to confirm that the power supply doesn't have problems. Um, so uh, the only true test is to just plug in another power supply and see if the problem disappears. So that's basically what we're going to go straight to now. So I'm going to start out by uh, disconnecting the power supply. We'll plug in a different power supply and we'll see if it comes on. Now in terms of my early predictions on what's happened to this thing, my friend said he did a bit of dusting and hoovering, but I did notice um, the bottom filter has a lot of surface dust on it and a lot of this has probably fallen off or been knocked off as the computer got moved around. So my early guess is, is that the power supply has been running hot and has burnt its, and something in there has burnt out. Um, it's an EVGA power supply so it's a good brand, however it is an 80 plus white which is very much sort of minimum standards, you know, this is the cheapest power supply that EVGA make kind of thing. And the other thing to keep in mind as well is that even a good brand can still fail. Just You can have the most expensive power supply money can buy. It can still fail. So um, while brand can be indicative of what might be wrong, it's not a sure thing at all. So again, keep that in mind as well. Uh, let's get another power supply. Ugh. All right, you know what time it is. It's Antec time. Right, let's unplug this guy and start unplugging all the things. So for the time being, we're just going to get the motherboard and the graphics card and the EPS connector because that's what we need for the computer to turn on. Um, it does bear mention that a a bad um, a bad serial ATA chain, like the, one of the power cables going to one of the drives, or just a bad drive might be causing a short circuit that might prevent the power supply from turning on. For example, if a TVS diode in the hard drive failed, you'd have a hard drive that's in a dead short circuit. That would prevent the power supply from turning on. <clears throat> Although it would probably blow up the hard drive first. But the point is that bad devices can prevent the system from turning on. And uh, we might need to plug all of those in to find out. But for now, I just want to know if the platform works. I want to know if this if if this is a motherboard issue or something like that. So let's get another power supply just plugged into the motherboard and we'll just see if it comes to life and posts because that gives us a lot of starting information. All right, that's that. Oh yeah, EPS. All right, EPS, ATX, and... PCI, 
Express. Bam. Right. Uh, also, i tell you what else I'm going to do. We all know what happened the last time I had a suspicious bad power supply on this channel. We had a shorted VRM MOSFET and we blew it sky high. So what I'm going to do, let's just go ahead and just check in case. I really doubt that is the, the case here, but it would be foolish of me to not check considering the last time we saw this, it was a bad VRM MOSFET. And as you can see, we have resistance and rising. So the resistance started off really low and now it's steadily climbing. That's all the input capacitors charging up out. Whoops. Yep. That's all of the input capacitors charging up off of the multimeter. So now we're approaching kilo ohms of resistance. So no problem. And the probing I'm using for that for good measure is I've got my red probe on the top row of pins, which will be yellow, and my black probe on one of the bottom row of pins. So we've got zeros along the bottom and 12s along the top. So that is that. No short circuits. God, it took me a completely unreasonable amount of time to set up for that shot. This is the problem with filming a repair. What would be a check that would take you 10 seconds suddenly takes five minutes because you have to walk across, get another light to shine it in, get all the cameras at the right angle just to get that shot of the EPS connector. Let's turn it on. Okay, standby power. And we've got the same um, RGB, well, not RGB, we've got the same orange LEDs. Oh, that's interesting. We've got an extra LED. There's a green standby power LED there. I'm fairly certain that wasn't on previously. I don't remember seeing that. That looks pretty indicative to me. Right, I'm not allowed to say ignition like I used to. I say ignition like turning the ignition of a car. I'm simply going to say power on. All right, it's come to life. So we should get output now as well. There we go. And there's our post. Right, so what this tells us is that we have a viable platform. 99% uh, certain this is a bad power supply at this point. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take the, power the old power supply out and I'm going to dust out all the dust and all the rest of it. A lot of people might have been watching going, oh, you should have dusted it first and oh, the dust is a fire hazard. Um, firstly, yes, you're correct. Dust could potentially be a fire hazard. But we don't have massive clumps of it in here. This is all just surface dust. Um, but I'm going to get rid of all of that. However, I'm not going to bother detail cleaning a computer if I'm going to if there's a chance that the whole thing is going to get thrown in a skip in the next five minutes. Um, what we now know is that because we have a viable platform, um, there's a very good chance that this is going to be a power supply. So now it's worth actually cleaning it up. I don't clean stuff before I fix it. I clean it when I know that it's actually going to survive. Uh, so yeah, um, I'm going to take this out the back, give it a good airline, then we're probably going to need to wipe it down and stuff like that. So here comes the clean montage. Well, the clean montage minus the dusting out the back. I can't be bothered to set up the camera for that. Right, I've given this a blast out with the electric dusters. There's, as predicted, there's a lot of surface dust. Um, compressed air, uh, air cans, stuff like that, they won't make your computer pristine. Um, you will, they, they just get all the worst of the clumps of it out. They're definitely a good place to start, but really the only way to actually clean all of the surface dust on is just to get it going there with a cloth and just wipe everything down. Fans, circuit boards and stuff like that, um, you'll need a, a brush or something. I use a paintbrush. However, also keep in mind that if you start using paintbrushes and you start wiping stuff down, do consider if you're in a static area or not. Um, I'm in the UK. It's 80% humidity here. Static is not a problem. If you're in Arizona with 2% humidity, you, again, you might need something else. So keep that in mind. This is just what works for me. Um, so... We've got to take the power supply out. Um, we've got to unpin all the cabling from the back here, which has been very nicely done. I think this is probably a PC specialist or something like that would be my guess. 
um, PC Specialist RA System Integrator in the UK. Um, and as with most SIs, they're pretty good at pinning all the cables back. Um, so we've got to undo all of this, sadly. So let's get to cutting. And I think we're going to end up pulling most of the computer apart. Um, and that just so we can clean it all while we're here. Because um, it seems like a shame. If you're going to pull all of this out, you may as well you may as well go the whole way and clean it. Um, but we'll see how far that goes. So, uh, as said, I'm just going to start pulling cables through. So let's get these out. Okay, there's our power supply. Sniff test. Mm. Can't smell anything, and my, my friend didn't report any burning smells or anything like that. More signs of just dust ingress around here, and just dust on the fan and stuff like that. I think that's what probably killed this thing. That would be my guess. So we can very quickly do a sanity check with this guy. Um, what I should have done after I tested with the Antec power supply connected, what I should have done was reconnect this one and confirmed with the drives disconnected and just the motherboard and graphics card hooked up that it was still dead. However, um, I'm 99% confident that it will still be dead. Like I mentioned, it could be a drive or a bad chain or something like that, but that's pretty uncommon, so you can, uh, you can roll the dice. But what I've done here... I'm just going to stick a cap on the end. This this guy is, um, ah, I call it a, a cap. Um, basically, it's an ATX socket, and it has the green connector linked up to ground. And what happens on a power supply is when you short, when you short the green pin to ground, that signals to power on. Uh, and you can do that with a paperclip. You can put a paperclip between the green pin and any black ground pin and that will tell the power supply to switch on. So what we've got there is because we are, we've shorted those pins out, when I plug the power supply in and switch it on, it should switch on. So let's see if it does. All right, so it's plugged in, and when I press the power switch at the back, we should see the fan start spinning. Nothing. So yeah, this guy is proper dead. Absolutely dead. Now, with bad power supplies, um, people often say, oh, can you fix them? Can there be repairs? Uh, it's difficult to say. Um, power supply repairs are a lot more complicated than people think. Uh, lots of people often go, oh, it's probably a bad capacitor. Just put new capacitors in it. Uh, most of the time, it's not the capacitors. Uh, it might be a blown up MOSFET in there. It might be a MOSFET driver. It might be the, um, the timing of a MOSFET, the, drive, the, gates, the gate timing to the MOSFET is slightly out. And you'll only see that with an oscilloscope and intimate knowledge on how power supplies function. Um, so repairing power supplies is a lot more complicated than people think it is. Um, and uh, the answer is, given the cost of most consumer-grade power supplies like this, it ain't worth it. So no, we're just putting a new one in. Good, so power supply out then. I'm gonna take the graphics card out and I'm gonna take out this rear exhaust fan so I can clean that properly. Um, and we'll just do a little bit more cleaning and then we'll start rebuilding this with a new power supply. It's a Zotac 1070 Mini. Still a nice graphics card. That being a 1070 is super cool. The only problem with mini graphics cards, though, is they tend to be noisier because they don't have the big, big heat sinks on them. So they're a bit more dependent on their fans for cooling. I think I've been slightly out of focus for half this video, which is frustrating. So uh, sorry if that was the case. Uh, right. Um, I'm going to take the CPU cooler off and check on the thermal paste as well while we're here because we know this thing has been dusty. Um, it's probably okay, to be honest, because it's got a big tower cooler on it. But um, 
I, if the computer has been dusty and I know the computer has probably been running hot, then it's worth checking on the thermal paste. And one, once you're this far into dismantling a computer, you may as well do it. Ugh. Uh, survey says... That's a bit dry, yeah. That's worth changing. Ooh, definitely worth changing, because that's an i7-6700. These guys like to run hot these days. The problem with the, I, with the Skylake era i7s is um, um, the, the thermal paste under the IHS, the integrated heat spreader, um, is bad. Uh, and that thermal paste does go off fairly quickly, and then you get really degraded performance. So the chip runs hot because it's very difficult to get the heat out of the chip. So you have to run um, more cooling to create a higher... Um, temperature difference between your cooler and the chip in order to get more heat out of the chip. Because there's two stages to cooling. There is getting the heat out of the chip and then there is dissipating that heat. And sometimes you need more of one and sometimes you need more of the other. Little 16 gig RAM kit in there as well, made by Crucial, so it's high quality. I'll put some fresh MX4 on this guy. These zip ties are put on by system integrators to stop the fan from falling off in transit um, because otherwise it would only have the little wire paper clips holding it on. Um, so for aesthetics, we could remove that if we wanted to. However, we don't particularly need to. And also the, the side panels for this case aren't in particularly good condition. So this isn't a show ready PC. So, you know, we're not too fussed about that. I'm not going to bother removing stuff because I don't need to. And also, since we're doing servicing stuff, let's just check how the RTC battery is doing. So multimeter into voltage mode. I'll stick my black probe on any screw, which will be a ground point. Red probe on the top of the battery. Oh, you're very low. That could be causing problems. So yeah, that could be causing issues where the BIOS keeps resetting or it keeps losing the time, that kind of thing. So we'll change that out while we're here as well. One more time, just for good measure. I'm just going to go to a different ground point just to make sure. Where's a really good ground? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Out it comes. Don't forget, if you pop out the RTC battery like this, it's going to reset BIOS. Ugh. For a computer like this, um, I know that there's not going to be anything super exotic set up in the BIOS, so you know there's no overclocks that I'm going to be clearing or anything like that. However, just keep in mind that changing your RTC battery or someone else's RTC battery will reset their BIOS, so make sure that you re-enable XMP or any other appropriate things, set the fan curves again, that kind of thing. So with the new battery in there, we now have 3.36, much better. So my threshold for a flat battery these days is anything below 3.1 in circuit. Um, now, you, you know, theoretically, you're you're good for anything over three volts in circuit. But keep in mind that if you're if if you've got the device in for servicing, you've got the covers off, and the cell is at like three point o two or three point o five even, just change it. You know, like I just pulled out another cell from this pack of twenty thirty twos. This pack was previously this big. I've slowly been eating away at them and it, I'm going to order another one after this video, another pack of these, and it will probably cost me three pounds, four pounds for 20 of them. So buy a bunch of cheap batteries and then you can just replace them on site whenever you see something that is vaguely not full. Just change it. 
saves a lot of just possible issues that the computer could have. Otherwise, I, I get this back, my friend gets it back, and you know, it, in tomorrow he then messages me again saying, the battery, the, the clock keeps resetting, or it keeps throwing up a message saying CMOS checksum failure, and I'm going to be like, should have changed the battery. So, yeah. I've mentioned a lot here about doing things when you have a reason to or feel the need. So, there's a strong argument to be made of why wouldn't you just change the thermal paste anyway? Um, and that is also a powerful argument. But again, it comes down to just experience and knowing what kind of problems you're likely to see. Um, most of the time, you know, less than perfect thermal paste isn't causing a real problem. Uh, and every time you start taking, you know, if you start taking more bits apart, you're giving yourself more work. And do you charge the customer for that work? You know, like, I'm going to town on this for the sake of the video and because it's a mate's PC. But, you know, if I was doing this for a customer and they're like, I want a new power supply in there and we're trying to do this for rock bottom prices, I'm not getting paid to do any of this. So you have to quantify how far you're going to go. You know, if the battery didn't need, you know, the battery did need replacing, the thermal paste probably didn't, if I'm honest. It was probably okay. Yes, I've probably lowered the temperatures a bit, which is good preventative maintenance, but I'm not being paid for preventative maintenance. I'm being paid to change the power supply, which I haven't done yet. So these are all the considerations that come up in all of this. Uh, let's get this. I'm going to take this fan out at the back and give that a clean out. A lot better. And if you really want to make your computer look like brand new again, I've gone, you go over this with a soft brush, with a paintbrush, then I've gone into all of the corners and stuff. I go in with the toothbrush to get into those corners there. And finally, I'm going to get my soft cloth and I'm just going to start wiping around the edges of the frame, wipe down each blade and so on to get all that surface dust off. There we go, and as you can see, we've got something that looks near as damn it brand new. You do all of that on all of your fans and your computer will look brand new again. It makes a big difference if you just want to, you know, like once the computer is mid-life cycle or late life cycle and it's just got that old and grossy look to it that you can't shift, that's what it takes. However, it is very time consuming, so wouldn't blame you if you didn't want to do it. Good, that's looking a lot blacker and a lot shinier in there now. So let's grab a new power supply and start fitting it. I'm going to put in this Corsair TX650M. I saw these go on sale for a ridiculously low price a while ago, so I picked up a couple for stock. And obviously, if you're a home user, you can't really pick stuff up in stock. But for computer shops and stuff like that, um, it's worth keeping an eye out for stuff, and when you see something at a good price, just buy a couple of them and stick them on your shelf so you've got them in stock, and you can get that extra bit of money just by being an opportunist buyer. Also means you don't have to pay for next day delivery and stuff like that. So this is a semi-modular unit, so we've got modular cables to the back, and then the ATX and uh, EPS cables are fixed. And a lot of people sneer at uh, semi-ATX, uh, sorry, semi-modular, um, but it's like, it's not like you're never going to use these cables, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, the only major advantage that fully modular has over semi-modular is that if you wanted to put in custom cables, like custom braided cables, on a fully modular, you can disconnect the whole thing and go fully braided from the power supply back. Whereas with a semi-modular like this, you're going to need to use extensions on these guys to get the braided um, look on it. Um, however, if you're going, like fully braided cable kits are expensive, man. So if you're doing that, you're probably building much more expensive anyway. So there's that. Now, normally for modular power supplies, I recommend fitting um, all of the modular cables that you plan on using in advance and then putting the whole thing into the case. However, for a chassis like this where there's no power supply enclosure, 
um, I start with by just putting the unit in and then plugging in cables as I need them. Um, and it means that I can just do it as I go. Now normally I like to put my power supplies in fan side up because that would negate the need for this filter to ever be cleaned. And it would also just be taking a bit more warm air out of the inside of the computer and just blowing that out the back. Uh, however, unfortunately, despite the fact that there's no enclosure on this, so you could go either way up, this case doesn't actually have um, uh, double mounts on the back. On most computer cases, um, on the back panel, there'll be two sets of mounting holes for the power supply, so it can go in any way up. But this case has only got a single set drilled on it, so unless I want to start drilling holes into this case, which I don't, um, we have to put it in fan side down. So, boo-hoo, and it goes upside down. Or the right way up, whichever. Now, in Corsair's infinite wisdom, there's no hole to run the EPS connector out the top left on this case. Um, it is theoretically possible you, to, um, you can lift the motherboard and run a flat cable like this one underneath the motherboard to get it out in the top left if you really wanted to do a super clean cable job on this. However, I don't really want to do that on this build because I want to make it, I want to keep it nice and uh, maintainable by other people. And also, as we mentioned earlier on, this isn't a show PC, so I'm not going to go mental with it. So we'll just run that over the top and we'll make sure that that's just tied up and out the way along the top of the motherboard. So um, even though it's having to cross along the top of the case, visually it'll be tucked out of the way. ATX connector coming in. So that needs to go like that. And I'm bracing the back of the motherboard as I push that in. Right, and all of the locking levers are closed. If the locking levers aren't closed, then it's not in. Right, now I'm going to put this hard drive cage back in. And I believe they're having trouble with this because the hard drive cage was actually in backwards, which is probably why they couldn't get screw holes to align. So that guy's going to go in that way around. So now we're going to run serial ATA power from the DVD drive. And that's going to go down via the SSD and come back in to plug into the power supply. And we'll need a second one of those for the hard drive as well. Now our graphics card can go back in. Now technically, we only need to go up like that. There's two choices for fitting in the PCI Express cable in a case like this. Um, you can either go out the back of the case and then come back in, uh, or you can just go straight up. And it depends on the ori it depends on how everything is oriented and what card you've got and stuff like that as to which I think would be better. For this particular one, I think we're going to be better off just going straight up. Um, because, yeah, otherwise we're going to have to come all the way through here and across. Um, but if I put it down here, I can put in a really nice folded cable that just comes directly up onto the graphics card. So I'm going to do that. Perfect. Right, and that's us done. So that should start up now. Uh, let's plug it all in and make sure it gets up to Windows. Okay, standby power. And power on.
Okay, it turned on, off and on. That's a power cycle. That was probably RAM training because we reset the BIOS. I'm spamming the delete key to smash into BIOS. It's a chill blast. There we go. Okay, press F1 to run setup. Yes, please. Right, so, how have we got XMP memory? We don't. However, on a, on a 6700, it's not going to make a meaningful difference anyway. So, if we had XMP, it'd be worth turning on, but it doesn't actually matter. Uh, fine. In that case, I think the only thing we really need to check is, we'll check our boot order and we'll check our uh, fan profiles. So, uh, let's see, boot. Boot manager, Windows Windows boot manager is set as number one anyway. That's fine. Um, CSM, I'm going to switch off CSM altogether just to make sure that we are all good. You kind of don't want CSM on unless you actually need it, just because it um, you don't want to accidentally be able to install from non-UEFI uh, sources. Uh, that's fine. Um, fine. All right. There's actually not very much that needs to be done here. Let's see. Uh, let's do the fan optimizer so we can get a optimal speed for the rear fan. Fan calibration is an Asus thing, although I think a couple of other motherboard brands have got an equivalent of it. And what that's going to do is spin up all the fans and then slowly bring down the speed until it finds the lowest speed the fan can do. This isn't very important for four pin fans um, because PWM has infinitely variable speed. Um, however, uh, voltage controlled fans like our rear case fan, uh, we definitely want to calibrate that. Otherwise, we're probably only going to be able to bring it down to like maybe 60%. But calibrated, it should go all the way down to 20, 25% which is good for nice, quiet idle speeds. And the fan just stalled, so it's found the zero point. Now it's looking for how much it needs to start the fan again. There it goes. And that start speed that it just found, that's the real minimum of the fan because um, it's a very easy trap to go into, where if you take a fan lower and lower and lower until it stalls, you think that's the minimum, but the problem is, is quite often the fan won't start from that voltage, so you need to go up a little bit further and use the start as the minimum voltage, otherwise if the fan stalls, then the fan controller will not be able to restart that fan, because most fan controllers aren't... In a laptop, most fan controllers will burst fire the fan to get it spinning, but um, desktop fan controllers don't seem to do that. They don't seem to hit it with 12 volts to start the fan and then bring it down. Maybe just to reduce uh, spool noise or something like that. Anyway, so the CPU, we're now going to set that to the silent profile. And uh, chassis fan... Chassis fan 2 is our rear fan. Um, let's see, what's it picked out? Yeah, so the manual profile it's dialed in. Um, that's its minimum. I'm going to leave that at what the auto calibrator is set. Um, on my computer, I tend to, I would probably push this dot a bit further to the right um, just to bring down, um, uh, just so the fan stays slower for longer. But the thing we have to keep in mind is that this is the only case fan in this build, and that 1070 will be knocking out a reasonable amount of heat. So we do want to make sure this fan is fairly aggressive and is clearing hot air out of the system. So I'm not going to I'm going to let that um, I'm going to let that spool up fairly early just to give the graphics card extra cooling. So that's all we really need to do here. So I will um, uh, I will F10 out of here. That all looks fine to me, and we'll just make sure it goes to Windows now. There we go, and there is our Windows login screen. So past that, we're all done with this. Uh, I'll stick the side panels off it, I'll give them a clean down as well, um, and then I shall call my mate and tell him that it's fixed and ready to go. So that was that. Pretty straightforward really, just a bad power supply, but it just shows you how, um, you know, if something like this happens to your PC, it's a good time to do some overall maintenance, and uh, yeah, shows you how to approach that. 
Hope you guys found that interesting. Thanks for tuning in, and I will see you next time. Bye for now.